My name is Elizabeth Jones. I am the Vice Chairwoman of Southwark UKIP. That's the area of London, the SE1 area. I'm sure you know where it is. And I'm also the PPC, that's the Prospective Parliamentary Candidate for UKIP in Dartford and Kent. It's just outside the London zone. Every now and then Boris Johnson pops into Dartford with the, the view to scooping it up and tucking it into London. But who knows how, what the future will hold, whether that will remain in Kent or eventually move to London. So that's where I am at the moment. Okay, so let's start <laughs> the interview. Um, so at the end of October, the UK government yes. decided not to support any rescue operation yes. in the Mediterranean Sea. They declare, Lady Annerley declared that uh, it was, uh, they considered it as a pull factor. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you comment this choice and uh, this uh, motivation? Right, okay. Well, for a start, nothing is ever what it seems. And if we look into it in more detail, we have to accept that, with all due respect, Italy has uh, a major economic crisis on its hands. It's, it's got a lot of difficulties with regard to public spending, public budget. And I understand that the current rescue package is what is called Triton, which is a combined EU effort, which is basically concentrating on border control. And the cost of that is about, I think, was it about two million pounds? Yeah, two million euros. More. Yeah, about two million Between euros. Two, mil two million and three million. Yeah, about two to three million euros a month. Whereas before that, the Italians had sole financial responsibility for Mare Nostrum, which was costing nine million euros a month. Exactly. And it's just not sustainable. No disrespect to anyone, it's a huge burden on a country that's experiencing some significant economic difficulty. So I think the Italians took a rational view and thought, well, this is just not financially sustainable. It's not popular with the electorate, with the ordinary people. They get quite resentful about the spend. So what do we do? So obviously then they had to back off and cancel Mare Nostrum, which was basically a sea rescue mission, as you know. And I think about last year, they rescue, rescued over 100,000 people. Exactly. But unfortunately, you know, the land of milk and honey runs dry and it may well be that the economic situation is that that's no longer sustainable. So clearly they had to then, perhaps I wouldn't call it downgrade, shift focus. So the Italian government shifted focus. Now. I think only eight European countries or eight countries in the EU are actually supporting the Triton mission with boats and personnel and finance and Britain isn't one of them because yes we did state that we considered that offering a secure regular rescue programme as Mare Nostrum did very professionally would actually be a, a draw factor and a pull factor for many of the people coming from Libya going through the very difficult process of paying people smugglers, I think an average is about £6,200 fee to make that treacherous cross the Mediterranean with the hope of getting to Europe. And I think the very fact that they, they think they've got that safety net there with the Mare Nostrum, that that would potentially encourage many more people to come. So that was the British thinking. And also, Germany followed suit quite soon after. I don't know if you're aware that the German government also expressed the same sort of opinion. Now, when I say nothing is ever what it seems, that is like the public expression of why we didn't support Triton. However, privately, we too have significant financial difficulties and we have recently had to pay £12 million to Calais to try and shore up their border security issues because our focus is geographic and our focus is more to do with our relationship with Calais and the issues arising therefrom with freight transport and our lorries coming in and out of those ports more than the focus would be on the Mediterranean. It's no disrespect, it's just geography, it's practicality. And we've had complaints from the, Fre the Freight Transport Association that their members are paying about, what, 4.2 million in fines every year because there's a new system now in Calais that if you're found, if your lorry is found with an illegal migrant, even if you don't know the person is there, you'll automatically be fined 2,000. So our focus is there. We can't really stretch everywhere. We simply don't have the money. You know, at the end of the day, follow the money, it's all about the cash. So that's been our focus now, is more to try and resolve the, the very great difficulties facing Calais. So I think that's probably our explanation for 
not supporting Triton. And of course, as we say, we do not want to facilitate or condone organised crime, because not only are these tra uh, human traffickers are getting these people to cross the Mediterranean, we don't know if they're trafficking women as well, who end up perhaps in Soho bars, which is a very sad and sordid journey indeed for any human to make. So that, I think, probably is our position with um, Triton. I'm a member of UKIP. We would support the uh, proposal that we should not be financially underpinning Triton. We've got our own issues with Calais. And you support, uh, do you agree with the choice of supporting Calais operation? Well, we have to because it's so close to us. It's not a question of whether we agree with it or not. It's a practical measure. We've got to do something because the French will not, for whatever reason, stop the, this congregation of migrants in Calais. It causes a considerable nuisance to the people living there. I don't know if you're aware about maybe about five or six weeks ago, there were open protests and demonstrations by local Calais traders complaining about the crush of migrants in that area and the sort of disharmony and dis instability that it's causing. So our focus really does have to be on Calais because, as I say, the Freight Transport Association is getting fined 4.2 million per annum. Haulage drivers are getting fined £2,000 for every migrant who's found in their transport. So it's something we really have to focus on. And what do you think about immigration, which is uh, increasing more and more in the UK? Well, what what UKIP would want to do would be have a blanket uh, application of the Immigration Rules 2014. I don't know if you're aware, I'm sure you are quite aware of those. It's, like, read something. it's like a bit like a point system. So if you're obviously a, you know, a healthy, able, educated person, of course, Britain will want you because we need the skill base. You know, we're expanding hugely in IT skills. We've got the Old Street Roundabout, which I'm sure you're aware of, where we're hoping to compete I don't know if we'll ever compete with Silicon Valley, but we're hoping to get into that league. We'll ever be, I don't think we'll ever completely compete, but at least we can open the door to that competition, that business competition. And of course, we need a regular stream of highly educated, highly talented people. And with the um, immigration rules, that can be achieved quite promptly and quite quickly. What the, the issue that we have is, of course, that in 2004, with the 2004-38 EC directive, which allowed complete freedom of movement, so people can travel all around Europe and they can live wherever they want. And that has resulted in every uh, big increase in the net migration numbers coming to the United Kingdom, which of course does put a strain on housing, it puts a strain on schooling, puts a strain on our prison systems. On average, the prison population in the United Kingdom is 87,000. Luckily, it's not that large, but a third of that will is comprising uh, Polish, Irish and Jamaican descent. So it's, a, it's an issue, and I think understand that 92% of ATM crime is caused by Eastern Europeans. Th these are not the sort of people who we would have in through the immigration rules. These are the people who are being swept up in the freedom of movement, who I'm sure her, their own countries are probably glad to see the back of. Yeah, probably. In fact, a lot of people is coming here because of uh, political reasons, religious mm. persecutions or something else, so they are asylum seekers. Well, they, they would be refugees. Yeah, refugees, refugees. or asylum seekers. Mm. And But actually, as I know, um, a little number of uh, people who mm. ask for asylum are really achieving it. Achieving what? The, the, uh, the asylum. Asylum. Well, yeah, asylum. Sorry, oh, sorry, I don't mind. I don't understand. Um, we will always have a door open to refugees. We've got a long history of looking after refugees when people are in great trouble. We understand that. We are humanitarian. We would assist people, but we also have to be careful about the fact that so many people will uh, readily exploit that system when, in fact, they're economic migrants. And uh, it can be quite, if you've seen the, the, the footage of Calais, you've seen the footage I'm sure of Lampedusa, it can be quite concerning when you think, my God, there's a huge number of very energetic, active young men from war-torn countries. We don't know who they are or what they are or what their agenda is in seeking to enter Europe. We don't know. And this does have to be looked at very carefully. We can't simply have an open border policy for immigration. We can't simply not go through the process of checking people's asylum applications. We don't. We just don't know particularly as many of these people are coming from Iraq or Syria. I'm sure you're aware of the political instability there and of the the ideological clashes over there. They're involved in a massive religious war. We don't know what side these people are 
on what, what their agenda is in seeking to enter Europe or indeed the United Kingdom. Our first duty is to the people who are already living here and to ensure their safety. And what about migrants who you said that they are full of energy and... Yes. But they are not high skill, but they come from, for example, people who cross the Mediterranean Sea. Yes. They come from mostly maybe Somalia, Eti Ethiopia, Ethiopia, Ethiopia. I, I think most of them come from, is it Libya? Somalia also a lot. Eritrea. Yes, Eritrea, yeah. Ethiopia, Somalia. Yeah, Egypt. Yeah, Egypt yeah. now is a little bit less, but... Mm. So, for, again, if these people are genuine, They could always apply in their home countries for EU visas. And again, if we were to have a full blanket application of the immigration rules, which we would for these people if they're outside the EU, then I'm sure that there would always be a demand at a certain level of numbers for such energetic young blood to come to the United Kingdom. It wouldn't be a door slamming on it, but it has to be managed. And it has to, we have to be assured that people who are coming here are not coming here to do us harm are not coming here to exploit the system, but are coming here to partake, join in, and be law-abiding citizens. Yeah, I understand this point. It's clearly and, uh, I mean, uh, comprehensible. But actually, some people cannot ask in their own country for, for example, visa or mm. documents, because they have clashes with their own country, mm. with their own institutions. So. I can understand that it is tricky from your point of view, yes. our point of view. Of course. But it's also complicated. Mm, it is complicated. From their yeah. point of view. And what should we do? I mean, ignore this fact if they don't have a, an official document? Or. Well, the, con right. well, the concerns I have are for a start, w with regard to the people smuggling. I understand the average cost of people smugg smuggling is about £6,200. That's a huge amount of money. So I don't know if that actually means that the people who are coming across the Mediterranean are the middle class or upper to middle class people of that country, I don't know, who have access to resources anyway. So the people who are really in dire straits are left behind in any event. So I don't know what that signifies. And with regard to trouble, I mean, clearly we have the UN who should perhaps, I think, take more of a role in this situation, particularly in the Mediterranean. And I think one goal for the UN would be to create an actual safe haven, which can be properly policed and ensure that there's a good quality, adequate accommodation for these people to stay in on a temporary basis, pending further investigation of their case. And I don't know if that could possibly be perhaps in North Africa or some somewhere in Europe. But um, I, I think that's just the, the constant passage of, of people who, who are strangers to us. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they're... Do they mean us harm? Do they, are they going to fit in? Are they going to cooperate? We don't know. I think it's a bit of a big ask and it's becoming more and more antagonistic for the electorate. It's becoming more of a turn-off, I think, for the electorate. Yeah, I understand. I, I don't know what it's like in Italy. I mean, what's your view? Uh, it depends. We have a different point of view, but of course we are trying to to comprehend this difficult situation that mm. people coming from Africa have because mm. it is clear. But on the other hand, uh, some people are complaining, of course, mm. because the number of uh, immigrants is higher and higher, mm. and uh, this is a uncontrolled and mm -hmm. uncon uncontrolled ph sure. phenomenon. But on the other side, they are like doing some jobs that mm people from Italy don't want to do mm. and so even if there is always the complaining oh they are stealing our job on the other hand mm. uh, they would never do that job so but these jobs that you say that the Italians just won't do would they not be done by people within the EU like for instance I know Moldova is going to be joining the EU in 2017 yeah we have we have plenty of people from the from Eastern Europe so are they are they the the people who are doing these current jobs. Yes. Right, so that position is more or less filled then by the sound of it. I don't know, the demand is always increasing. Mm. For example, we have uh, a lot of uh, people from the East okay. who is look caring, mm. taking care of uh, old people. Mm. Which is very And much the needed, demand yeah. is always, always increasing. Well, I'm sure that that then can be done in a legal manner and I'm sure that Italy can control its borders and decide who it's going to have living in its homeland uh, and that can be done in a calm legal manner 
I, I, I think it's a bit much for people really to expect. I mean, what right do these people, let's say, let's say from, for example, Iraq or whatever, uh, what right do they have to think, right, well, okay, well, I think I'll just go move to another country right now because it's not wealthier. I'll just turn up in the dead of night, sneak in and do it that way. I mean, what right do they have? I mean, would, would we, we have that right if we were in significant difficulties for whatever reason, why our, let's say our country was extremely fragile and absolutely riven with utter corruption. Uh, we wanted to get out. Do you think that we would be afforded I think, that, think people, be afforded that? Yeah, I think that people, I think that in Italy, even if there are many different points of sure. views, in the end there is a sort of solidarity. Mm. I mean, if uh, in Iraq you are a civil pe person mm. who didn't anything wrong. Mm. I mean, you just was born in the wrong place sure. at the wrong moment and you were unfortunate. On the contrary, we were born in Italy. Mm. We are not perfect, but we cannot complain. So, I mean that in the end uh, we we feel that we have to somehow help other people. Of course, people we would always, yeah. people. We'll always support, um, as I say, we'd always support a humanitarian crisis will always house refugees, but this manner of going about it, where you're, just, you're paying a large amount of money, where well, I don't know where they get the money from. They'd probably say, well, I've sold everything I had. Well, you know, is that true? Is that not true? We just really don't know. The, 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 the way and means of going about things, I think, is wrong. I don't think they should be uh, endeavouring to do this and sort of for, force their way into other people's countries in this way. Yeah, it's a very complicated mm. issue at the end of the day. I mean, if it's a situation where, as I say, they have rec recognised refugee status, then all well and good, they will be given protection. Yeah, but sometimes it's really difficult to... If a person is a refugee, mm. he, come, he comes without any document because he cannot ask mm. them for them. Maybe without money because uh, he spent the money for uh, the travel or... I don't know, I've listened to some stories uh, and so you you can sometimes you cannot really. But I also understand that Italy's been taken to the European Court of Human Rights on four occasions now for not giving such people their um, asylum and yeah, refugee yeah. rights. Yeah, um, Italy changed yeah. a bit. The and I think that they have actually unlawfully deported people back to Greece. I know when they've come in illegally they to Greece. They did it. Uh, they did it during. I think it was 2009 mm. during Berlusconi and. Uh, there was an increasing number of people of Lega and Orda, I don't know. Oh you yes, know. yeah, I've heard of those. And they considered uh, immigration, the illegal mm. immigration, mm. Uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but illegal. Mm. So, and they organized uh, some trip to mm. bring back people. But it was uh, just for a period. And in that period, actually, Marin Ostrom was not uh, only a, a refugee operation, mm. a search and uh, save operation, but it was also to control the border. Mm. And it was, I think that Berlusconi had also uh, an agreement with um, with Gaddafi, and so the border was were extended until Libyan border. Right, okay. And Mare Nostrum could move uh, mm. more uh, farther. farther. That must have been a titanic cost for you. Yes, it huge. Was, it was. I imagine it would be a huge cost. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> we, in Italy we have so many problems with the money mm. and uh, corruption and mm. cost and taxes. So the Mare Nostrum money are well mm. spended, maybe better than others. Maybe, maybe, but it. At nine, was it nine and a half million euros a month? It's, you've got to justify that to your electorate. Mm -hmm. So it is quite a, quite a difficult thing. And I, you know, I do feel sympathy with the Italian government having to make that decision. It's a hu huge, huge drain on resources. Yeah, it was. It so, was. Yeah, I'd imagine it would be. But I mean, you have the Triton is now in place. So. Uh, yeah, it will last, I think, just for uh, two months. More. Okay. And. I think I don't know if mm. they will extend it or not at the end, but uh, we will see. It's a very, I mean, I'm, I've started to study this uh, mm. this topic, and it is really tricky and mm. complicated, and it has plenty of. Uh, I mean, I suppose much of it has been caused by the removal of Gaddafi as well. Yes, also. 
Yes. So that has uh, had a huge impact, I should imagine. Yeah. And we were like supporting these. Because uh, I mean, we as Western yeah. societies, mm. we were supporting Gaddafi and Assad. Uh, mm. And. But then, of course, you, particularly to Italy, you were very involved in his removal, weren't you? Mm. And then between March 2011 and October 2011 uh, in Britain, we were uh, supporting the aerial bombing campaign with mm. Libya. So, yeah, exactly. it was quite a problem. So we will <laughs> see. That's all we can very, do. Yeah. yeah, it's very problematic. But I, I, I don't know what the current numbers are. Are they going down now? Do you know of, of the people? I suppose it's very difficult for them to estimate the yeah. numbers coming through. Uh, I know that. 20,000 people died, mm. uh, 100,000, uh, 100, maybe more, mm. I think 150,000, but I've read uh, the data a few days ago, were uh, rescued, mm. and there are some people which are... I suppose it's difficult to work out the, yeah. the early figures. Yeah, I, I, was, I, I looked it up, I think the, the number one country that for for the Mediterranean is Eritrea, then Syria, then Sub-Sahara. Yeah. And uh, Greece took in the um, d took in the largest number of um, <coughs> sea migrants. And then it was yourselves, and then mm -hmm. Spain. Obviously, mm -hmm. this is going to be in that area, isn't yeah, it, in the Mediterranean? It's clearly geography. No, of course. It's like us with Calais, so, mm -hmm. you know, that's our focus, really, obviously not the Mediterranean to such a degree. Okay. So, anything else you want to talk about? No, it's... Uh, <laughs> I think anything we, else? we've talked uh, a bit of the topic. So, I, ha want mm, I have to say, to say that... something else. No, all I would say with the UKIP policy would be to... We, we are sympathetic to Italy. We understand that the strain they're going under, particularly as, you know, that they're suffering with... I don't know if you consider that you... I don't know what you think of Berlusconi's view that Italy should have two currencies. I don't know how you, you'd manage that. Yeah, I've read it, but I didn't take it seriously. I don't know how. Really. I'd be interested to see how you manage that. It's quite a bit of excitement. Uh, no, I mean, mm, I don't take Berlusconi seriously anymore. Well, no, I suppose he's very much yesterday's man. But um, yeah. interesting that he threw that out there. So um, we we do have a lot of sympathy to the Italians' plight, of course. You know, it's a very uh, difficult situation and very very expensive at a time when we can't afford such expenditure. It was a, a big problem. I mean, if you could have it managed or controlled in such a way, it would be better. I mean, would it be better for, perhaps for the Italians to... I mean, I suppose you can't have a Calais situation because you, mm -hmm. can't, you cannot manage the Libyan uh, coast to the degree that we can assist with the Calais coast. Yeah, I mean, perhaps if you, if you could, then perhaps you could have people coming in in uh, controlled numbers and controlled manner, which would be best for everyone. But I suppose it's a matter for the uh, Italian government, really. Yeah. It's also complicated because it's people. <laughs> it is. It's yeah. Everything's very complicated for sure. So um, yeah, we have every sympathy for the Italian government. It's a huge responsibility to for the Italian government to shoulder, and they've shouldered it very well. I think you know, you soldier on having to pay out nine million euros a month. And also, I think so that also the population of Lampedusa were they were a candidate for the Nobel Prize. The oh, population yeah. of uh, the island, because they rescue, there were mm. plenty of fishermen or people who were uh, just sailing, rescued um, many, many people. So, yes, it's a uh, yes, one good aspect um, no, about my no, country. <laughs> well, your, your country's got much uh, to its credit, so I not uh, say that. But I mean, what, what was I think I was reading also there was an issue about it, 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 Italy sort of basically I don't know if this is correct w with the Lampedusan people basically shifting them as f uh, into the other European countries as soon as possible. I think that might have been the issue or why they were taken to the European Court of Human Rights. Oh, what? Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, I think there might have been an issue so, uh, about Italy when when the migrants arrive. I don't think uh, uh, that they were then passing them on quickly through Europe because I think a lot of the migrants. No disrespect to Italy, but I don't think many of the migrants' final destination choice was Italy. No, no, and of course it not. Is not. Probably Germany or Britain, or also northern northern countries. Okay, so it'd be the um, nor so I presume it'd be Germany, probably United Kingdom, because I should imagine most of the people there can speak English, uh, and then of course, as you say, the Scandinavian countries. So yeah. I understand there was some criticism I was reading about Italy facilitating the rapid dispersion. When in fact, as presumed with asylum, people they should house and protect in the first country they've arrived at, as I understand. 
Yeah, yeah, it is. If you ask for asylum mm. and you can have asylum in mm. that country, you should have asylum mm. in that country. But yes, uh, how to say it? I, I think that it is not easy to control, and I think that of course Italy see that it is a great and problematic issue. Mm. So of course, probably they would have let people we'll go wherever they mm. they want. But also, I think that I've read some some books, mm -hmm. articles and publications and actually people who cross the Mediterranean Sea they don't really know what, where precisely sometimes they do, sometimes mm. not but it's just uh, another life, it's Europe it's uh, the, the other coast you know so. I mean I think it would be worthwhile investment for perhaps again the UN if they can, if they have the yeah, facility probably. to do that to, um, I mean, I think there does really need to be a detailed investigation as to why the migrants' homelands are in so brittle and in yes. such a state of chaos that these people have to make such a brave journey. I mean, really, I do think it's everyone's right to be able to grow up, have a family, have a professional life or an earning life uh, in the homeland. Yeah, and I to have to leave, to have to leave because of the infrastructure of the country or the level of corruption is uh, a crime against humanity and I think that the UN needs to look at what's going on with these countries why why are they consistently so incompetent why is there a consistent level of incompetency with these countries that they cannot maintain their own young population and cherish them yeah I agree UN should have a, they should, a yeah. bigger role yeah, they should, most certainly should there's no point, I know mean, we had that Francois Crepeau man criticising Britain and our, uh, Britain's comments about the situation with regard to uh, migration and I thought, well, you know, it's all very well for him to comment, but what exactly is the UN doing? Yeah, very little. Exactly, so, you know, don't, don't, don't throw the criticism. If you're not going to prepare to do anything, don't criticise. So, um, is there anything else? Anything else? Not for me, it's yeah. a Great, I think that's it. Anything 